Thank you very much, Jose Manuel. Just to say that I'm delighted to be here presenting this joint work that we have done with ILO, one of many areas in which we're collaborating fruitfully. Uh, and also to say that uh, as a result of this uh, joint work, um, all of the introductory comments and the thanks that Jose Manuel made at the beginning of his presentation apply to both of us in both institutions, so I will get on with the presentation. Um, I do want to say that I suspect many of you have sort of stylized facts about what each institution stands for. Uh, and uh, I just want to point out that I hope you'll notice uh, we're defying a little bit uh, conventional wisdom on that front with Jose Manuel presenting the findings on the macro and sectoral policies. And I'm going to be talking about the social policies. <laughs> that is not just because we feel we're interchangeable and can talk about both, but really to emphasize the point that it's the integration of the measure, it's the package of the complementarities that really matter. So let me turn then to the policies uh, that uh, the countries that are in the database, the 77 countries, undertook to stimulate labor demand, connect people to job, and protect incomes. <laughs> Uh, so starting off with the first set, uh, which has to do with the, the policies for protecting employment and creating jobs. Many of the countries surveyed uh, did intervene to protect employment and create jobs. Uh, this was done primarily through two types of policies, wage subsidies, mainly used in the high income countries that you'll see and public works and services uh, that were mainly prevalent in the middle-income countries and the low-income countries. Wage subsidies took the form of reductions in social security contribution rates or direct payments to employers for creating jobs, and they were targeted either at current employees or to new entrants. Out of the 77 countries in the inventory, 24 countries actually decreased their social security contributions during the crisis, all of them in Europe. Uh, uh, sorry, they reduced their contributions during the uh, crisis, 10 on a permanent basis, and all of the 10 were in Europe. And the rest of them did so on a temporary basis for a period of certain months. Uh, you have, uh, if you've had a chance to take a look at the report, a nice box on the Turkish example, uh, where the Turkish government uh, did undertake measures to reduce social security contributions. It had several elements on, uh, in it. Uh, just to highlight a few, there was a general reduction in social security contributions, but there were also some targeted ones, targeted at women in particular, and uh, youth that were previously unemployed. And the uh, Subsidy uh, was uh, paid out of the accumulation of unemployment insurance funds uh, that hadn't been uh, utilized. Uh, and it was on a sliding scale over a period of five years with 100% contribution at the beginning and then declining to 20% uh, at the end of the uh, five years to go down to zero. Uh, there were also uh, a, a reduction in Social Security contributions to generate increased demand, create jobs in some of the poorer regions in the country. So I think that's an interesting example for us to have a look at. Uh, to turn to the low-income countries and speak about the public works programs that were the most favored, if you will, way of uh, responding, uh, countries were able to deploy this uh, when they already had systems in place. And a good example is the Mexico Temporary Works Program, where there was already something functioning, so it was easy for the government to be able to expand the coverage. Uh, and uh, just to note, which... Uh, does really stand to reason when countries don't have these programs in place. It's really difficult in times of crisis to start a program from scratch and be able to achieve scale. Uh, to turn to the supply side now, the first side part uh, was about the uh, policies to stimulate or protect demand, if you will. Uh, and the second set of policies in this area uh, are about preserving the skills of the workers and connecting them or keeping them connected to their jobs. The focus in the middle and low income countries was on employment services and training. 
the latter focus both on the employed, uh, also as part of work sharing arrangements, uh, and the unemployed through skills training and job matching via employment services. Some countries, such as Germany and Sweden, expanded their existing training programs considerably, uh, up to 36% of the labor force. In Latvia as well, which was a country that was really hit severely by the crisis, uh, the government used training as one of its responses. The number of participants in training programs tripled in Latvia uh, in the period of one year from 8,600 workers to 20, more than 29,000. And similarly in the Russian Federation as well, there was a significant expansion of training programs. Uh, now, one of the issues with the database, and, and Arup alluded to it, this is really an inventory. It really doesn't tell us a whole lot about the effectiveness of what the countries undertook. We just know what they did, but not sufficient information about how well they did it and how effective is what they did in the given context. So on this, so I'm going to editorialize a little bit without having any information. <laughs> uh, so it's debatable, I guess, whether employment services uh, or increasing uh, emphasis on employment services is helpful uh, during a time when you have a job downturn because you have fewer jobs available. So uh, providing support to workers so that they can uh, they know where the jobs are uh, and uh, giving them more information, equipping them with job search skills you know, may not be particularly helpful at a time when the job market is, is shrinking, but it can certainly be helpful when the recovery starts. Uh, on the other hand, uh, training, I would say, is certainly a good response because it is talking about ensuring that the people, the workers retain their skills or in some instances even upskill them because we know one of the issues with prolonged periods of unemployment is the loss of the attachment to the labor force and the loss of the skills, which makes it more difficult for workers to find jobs when the uh, recovery comes around. The question on the training programs is then how well designed are these programs and really how much, how well do they do in imparting those skills that will then become useful when the recovery happens. Again, this goes to the question about the effectiveness of what countries did. Um, third set of policies is looking at uh, the um, what countries did when it came to insurance and assistance programs. And what we find is that regardless of income, the majority of countries surveyed, 69 out of the 77, expanded insurance and assistance programs. Countries with unemployment benefit schemes, and there aren't many of them, uh, certainly not in the low income and the middle income countries, increased either the duration of unemployment benefits or the level of increase the level of unemployment benefits and in some instances expanded coverage as well by reducing by facilitating eligibility if you will reducing the eligibility criteria uh, and governments in several countries also uh, facilitated access to health services. What I found interesting in this picture is also, if you take a look at the pension scheme, it's the one where you see both an increase in uh, generosity, if you will, expansionary measures, because some countries did increase the basic pension. Uh, but you also have austerity at the same time. Uh, I think many countries in the region that I work with in previously in Eastern Europe took advantage in some sense of the crisis to uh, reform their pension scheme, which in many instances was unsustainably uh, generous. So you see a combination of the two things going on when it comes to pension schemes here. Uh, countries also expanded their safety nets uh, to protect the poor. Uh, here again, there, there may, there's an issue that we might want to think about uh, is that um, with the increase in uh, social insurance, which really is primarily about the formal sector, and the social assistance programs are primarily about the poor and the vulnerable, there's a question about whether some workers uh, that earn enough to, so that they're not eligible for the social assistance programs but are in the informal sector and therefore don't have access to formal social insurance may have fallen through the cracks um, 
because of this, this, if you will, the lack of continuity or integration uh, in these programs in countries between social nurse programs and social assistance programs. Among the social assistance programs, uh, conditional cash transfer uh, programs were utilized uh, quite effectively to expand coverage. In Brazil, for example, the Bolsa Familia program quickly responded by expanding coverage to 12 million families and increasing the amount of transfers by 10% in 2009. Again, an interesting policy question here is um, how do countries think about scaling up is fantastic to be able to respond in times of crisis. Uh, scaling back when the crisis is over requires really thinking about how one does the scaling up in the first instance. So this is about what we um, saw in the database. Um, so by way of looking ahead, if you will, and already Jose, uh, Juan Manuel, Jose Manuel touched upon this a little bit, um, which is to say what we see really is a um, tremendous number of countries that responded to the crisis, not just in terms of macro policies, um, stimulative fiscal policies, but also intervened directly to protect or create employment, preserve skills, facilitate matching between job seekers and employers, and protect the incomes of the unemployed and vulnerable groups. And in many cases, as the Swiss minister noted, social dialogue helped guide the policy response. This is a lot more than what we have seen in previous crises. I was working in the East Asia region at the time of the East Asian crisis. And the kinds of responses that countries were able to mount at that time really paled in comparison to what we see today. And a lot of that, I think, is the both the increased readiness uh, of countries to be able to respond, but also the point that Jose Manuel said, this was not a regional crisis. This was a crisis that really was global in nature. But still, there are questions about, even with this um, increased responsiveness that I talked about, there are questions about how well-prepared countries are to respond to economic crises in the future. Um, many developing countries, for example, as I mentioned, did not have social security programs that could be called upon to respond in times of crisis, these automatic stabilizers that we talk about in developed countries. In addition, across the board, the coverage of social insurance program, programs, even when they existed, was quite low. Active labor market programs such as employment services, training, and weight subsidies were commonly used but there are concerns about their design. How effective, again, going back to the point that I made earlier, how effective are these programs so that when we scale them up, we know that they're doing good. Finally, uh, an important point is uh, the ability to really see where the crisis is having an impact. What part of the country and what types of people are being affected. And that really requires having a solid information base. And many countries still lack surveys or administrative data to track the impact of the crisis on labor markets, workers, and others. So many of the things that are on this last slide are things that countries should be doing in any case. These are good things to do in good times but they will also help countries prepare better for the next crisis when that happens. Thank you.